So I would uh, like to welcome you all um, very warmly to this um, uh, webinar uh, on the UNESCO OER Action Area Inclusive and Equitable uh, OER and to the um, uh, Open Education Global um, Conference taking place online together with University on the Nance. It's uh, great to, to be here together with you. I have followed the conference since it starts and had presentations myself and also moderated one session yesterday. So we have a great um, uh, program, uh, as you can see here on the screen, we have five presenters. Uh, <clears throat> so a very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, please remember that you can use the chat to introduce yourself and also to write your reflections, comments, uh, questions, and we will uh, try to have a look at um, and keep an eye on the chat and to follow the, the discussion and conversation. Uh, my name is, um, as I said, Airbus Jan Nilsson. I'm a professor in innovation and open online learning, and I'm based in Sweden, in the south part of Sweden. Um, I do uh, a lot of international work as I am since six years ago, uh, an independent researcher and consultant and quality reviewer in the area of uh, open and flexible uh, and distance learning. Earlier on, I worked at Lund University and um, more or less with the same kind of questions, uh, but also for other university as a consultant. Uh, now I'm working mainly at the, with the international organizations like um, uh, ICDE, which is the International Council for Open and Distance Education. I'm in the board and standing for election for a new period of time uh, this year. Uh, and also um, I'm sharing for the third uh, mandate period, the ICD OER Advocacy Committee. So I'm an ambassador for OER for ICD. And we have um, uh, ambassadors from all the regions and continents uh, in the world. We are 12 of us. And we had um, the pleasure to work with, um, with James also earlier for uh, two periods of time as an ambassador for ICD or our advocacy committee. So good to see you here, James. I'm also in the quality network for ICD and I do lot some quality uh, reviews for them as well. Um, I'm in the European Distance E-Learning Network, uh, also in the board and doing a lot of work uh, also for them on quality. I have um, recently been uh, involved now with the International Council on Batches and Credentials and um, uh, on Monday, uh, Friday, sorry, uh, we launched, uh, we put the quality grid and the taxonomy, uh, which ICD is working on. So it was on their webpage since last week. And since uh, this week, I am um, uh, working with the Swedish Council for Higher Education, as they have um, an assignment for making um, distance education with higher quality and uh, with a new, so I'm responsible for taking, taking on, on a new quality framework for distance education in the country to be more um, both um, modernized and uh, digitalized and uh, better for the learners in many aspects. So that is rather new, new uh, post I had, which is very, very interesting. So what you can hear is that I um, work very much about uh, quality related issues and the field of open and flexible learning. Uh, so by that, uh, I will um, present the speakers and as I will also take the opportunities to, opportunity to um, um, encourage you to go to the platform where you have the presentations with the abstract and more uh, bio from the, uh, from the presenters and also where you can communicate uh, um, both uh, during the conference and also afterwards and make contact and connections and um, share your reflections and questions. So please take the opportunity because this is a wonderful platform. I heard uh, that uh, it is Alan who is the brain behind it. And it's really, really good. So thank you very much for setting up such a wonderful platform for this uh, wonderful conference. And please uh, take the use of it because um, we can share a lot of uh, interesting things that, that there and together we can be stronger. So I see we have uh, almost uh, 30 participants in the web in the room by now. And again, please you, you put your questions or reflections and also some information where you are from in the chat. 
uh, this uh, session will be like that, that we have uh, the first presentation. And after that, we will take the questions for that presentation. But for the rest of the presentations, um, I will we'll have uh, everyone in uh, all, all the presentations in, in a row. And um, then we take the questions uh, afterwards. But as, um, as uh, Gino had to leave, we will do it uh, this way. So I hope that is OK for everyone. And each of you have uh, 20 minutes, um, approximately, uh, for your presentation. And um, the first one is uh, coming from uh, Kelly Liberty, Lungsis um, Longo, Molia Bundamina, and Gino Fransman. Sorry if I don't pronounce your names uh, in a very open way, maybe. <laughs> um, I know myself because my name is also very difficult to pronounce, uh, even for Swedes. So, and the presentation is about uh, becoming an open education influencer. The Nelson Mandela University students advocates experiences of sharing uh, BOE. So, um, please, um, the floor is yours, and um, please um, start your presentation. We are looking very much forward to it. So, you know, I think it's your, you who will do it. Thank you so much, Eva, and welcome to everyone. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's raining in Kebeja, which is the new name for the town or city that we are in here in South Africa. We are from Nelson Mandela University, and I'm joined today by one of the open ed influencers um, themselves, one of the team. Her name is Molia Vundamina. Eba, I think that um, we need to stop your screen share. Thank you so much. So I will just um, share my screen. Just please note that we have two parts for this presentation, a quick um, PowerPoint driven presentation, and then I'll play a short video for you to uh, preview something that's never been seen before in the world of open, I think. So we are so excited to be here and thanks for joining us. Of course, once you share, just make sure that you have the sound on. So as I said, my name is Gino Franzman, and I'm joined by the wonderful Molia Wundamina. Thanks for joining us here at OE Global 2021. Um, hashtag Open Ed Influencers, that's who we are, Open Ed Influencers, shortened to OEs. Uh, the course we're speaking about is called Bowie, and it stands for Becoming an Open Ed Influencer. So this is the Nelson Mandela University Student Advocates Experience of Sharing Bowie, but more than that, also about professional development by engaging with Bowie. So the Open Ed Influencers are supported and funded by the Sia Pumalela program. Sia Pumalela means we succeed. And this is an initiative um, under the OER Africa umbrella, which is also funded by the Kresge Foundation. And we are so grateful for the support because it's meant we've been able to leap forward in truth. So what are open influences or OEs? And you can say this out loud in your head, OEs. Right. These are ambassadors for open education who increase awareness of open education resources and open education practices. OEs facilitate the adoption, creation, and licensing of OER. Open ed influences energetically advocate for the use of open textbooks across purpose, faculties, and schools. So we are here because we've been threaded into sort of um, cohorts um, related to the UNESCO Sustainable Development Goals. The Bowie project aims to contribute towards the Sustainable Development Goals in whatever capacity or space really, by enabling advocacy through an online empowerment course. The Open Ed Influences project aim is to empower people to activate these goals by doing something about achieving it. And Bowie is that vehicle. Molia will continue. The OE team started in 2018 and being student-based, it often changed with students entering or exiting the institution. 
the Bowie course was developed to support and empower each team member and the larger community. In 2020 and 2021, new additions are shown on this slide, including myself. Um, a little bit of information about myself. I'm in the process of completing my master's degree in public law. I'm working on submitting the final copy of my dissertation after examination. My dissertation was dealing with unfair discrimination against female asylum seekers. I am a writing respondent with the academic literacies and writing program. I recently became an OE in 2021, as previously stated. From assisting with the editing of the course and being one of the first to complete it, I've seen firsthand how much effort and passion have been put into this course. The course is relevant to most current issues surrounding us. There are six modules in the course. The first module is open, where I learned about open textbooks, videos, and other educational and informative materials. I also learned how to license work and share it with others without infringing any copyright laws. In advocacy, I learned about the different types of advocacy how and who to advocate to impactfully. The recent Zambian elections are a good example of the level of advocacy we wish to promote. The Zambian youth peacefully advocated for change by articulating their grievances through social media and petitioning and reaching out to opposition leaders. They did so without the destruction of property or injury to people. They came together for the greater good of the country. They articulated themselves and respected opposing views. Although they weren't participants of Bowie, this is an example of the type of advocacy and responsiveness that can be achieved by the student community through proper advocacy. In the Ubuntu module, uh, we, we learned about the promotion of Ubuntu through social cohesion programs. Under facilitation, the module emphasizes the importance of sensitivity, cultural awareness, and objectivity in, the facilita in facilitating any process. The influencing module dealt with the different platforms to promote causes, drive change, and advocate for share shared values and with audiences. Also, it's important to note that influencing one person makes a big difference. It's a success in the overall picture. Finally, the SDGs module was so pertinent to my research findings. One of them was that most asylum seekers and refugees are unable to access education because they can't afford it. OERs are a way to promote and achieve some of these SDGs because they're all interconnected. So we just need to start from somewhere. I have been able to apply open to working as a writing respondent. I often refer students to openly licensed materials when I review student drafts. However, there are several gaps when it comes to specific disciplines. Bowie will have several benefits for both students and academics. The advantages of Bowie for students are that it will change the way that students think about themselves their communities and the world at large. It's also an opportunity uh, for students to think outside the box and it will help burst the bubbles that we often live in. Ubuntu will encourage them to do better for themselves, their families and their communities. Bowie will change how students learn by encouraging them to go beyond the classroom and the curriculum. It will also help them advocate for change using modern technology that they have available to them. For example, through Twitter and other social media platforms. It will also provide networking opportunities with fellow students and other people participating in the course, which will result in the sharing of knowledge, ideas and collaborations. The advantages 
of student engagement for academics are the following. It will enable academics and lecturers to understand how their students learn and think. It will enable them, it will enable staff and students to move towards meaningful solutions and innovative approaches to challenges in education. It will create opportunities to engage with diverse realities across the student body. They will develop and, and they will develop knowledge and understanding of the current circumstances that students are faced with to provide more tailored responses. Uh, for example, their home environment, their school backgrounds and any learning challenges that students may be encountering. Similarly, the advantages for students are also applicable to academics and lecturers. As we all know, 2020 came with its own unique set of challenges, working online. Other members of the OE team shared some of their experiences. According to Kelly, the course suddenly had so many contributors. This made it difficult to follow the progress of the course development. She had challenges knowing her role among so many other people who had more experience. She struggled to keep up with meetings in a home setting with many disruptions from family and pets. Likewise, Mlungisi stays in the hills of KwaZulu-Natal and, and he actually had to break lockdown rules at times to access a data connection. He struggled to find a suitable space to engage in work and meetings at home. So, um, Thank you for your attention. Gina will continue from here. Thank you, Malia. So Malia was speaking about the challenges that some of the OEs and the team experience. And I think that these are common challenges in, in sort of an education community or scenario. So the road to becoming an OE um, really consists of a lot of training and doing. Um, Anything we didn't know, we had to do research. And for example, with the OEs, with the team, open licensing was a big learning curve. Um, before lockdown, uh, that was in 2020, just prior to lockdown, um, the Commonwealth of Learning's Understanding OER course was really instrumental in launching an awareness and understanding of OER and in all its many dimensions. It was quickly apparent though, that we needed to grab students' attention by using lots of media and graphics. It was an empowering and an upskilling process to have the team curate suitable OER content. And so we used the care framework in order to conspicuously attribute all of these all the time. You can watch our May during lockdown video where we profile our working towards open textbook advocacy year at Nelson Mandela University. I think that I saw Earl uh, put that link into the chat uh, window of, of brief while ago. Uh, you can also just go and search Open Ed Influences on YouTube and get access to all of our channels. The May During Lockdown is a series of videos we worked on since March 2020 and in collaboration with UMass Amherst, Sarah Hutton and co. Um, along with Dr. Robert Farrow from the Open University UK. Um, you'll also find all of the video content that is used in all of the different modules in Bowie available there, each under a playlist of its own. So this year we had about 375 student leaders um, take Bowie as one of the sort of professional development and upskilling interventions that we set out for them before they engaged with an incoming cohort of new students to the university. One of the students said this, and I'll just read a piece of it. This was about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African philosophy, which is basically I am because we are. So um, the content of the modules is very insightful. I had a simple one layer definition of what Ubuntu is. And that was solely based on the explanation I'd received from my parents and the interactions I've had growing up. The information in the modules opens up a whole new idea of what Ubuntu is and still maintains the core beliefs of what I learned as an African child. On open education resources, I had no idea what this meant. And after watching the videos and reading the notes, I know what it is. 
I'm very surprised that the education system in South Africa is not exploiting this cost effective and efficient way of delivering high quality education. So you're interested in Bowie yet? Here are the steps for enrolling into Bowie. Um, go to engage.mandela.ac.za, validate your account, sign up using the Google um, link there, and then send your details to myself, send your name, surname, and Gmail account to gino.fransman at mandela.ac.za, and I can enroll you. We are working on creating an enrollment key so that all of this is really a self-directed um, exercise on your part. Coming up in 2021, in November, the 17th of November to be exact, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. South African time and on Zoom, we have the third Open Ed Influences, Open Ed Colloquium. So this is Open Ed Colloquium 21. And this year, our aims are quite literally encapsulated under three hashtags, and these are disrupt, decolonize, and develop. We're not pulling anything down and not leaving something positive in its place. The purpose is to create awareness of open education and to promote the use, adoption, and creation of open educational resources. Towards this, we also have an open textbook fellowship that we are launching. We are now in the middle of a pilot for 2021, but in 2022, that expands dramatically and is available for our staff either academic or professional. I want to acknowledge the inputs, the efforts, the talents, kindness, and generosities of all the contributors. You can see this is a lot of inputs. This is a truly collaborative project. And um, it's been kind and generous from everyone, especially in a time of pandemic, pandemic, and I'm trying to help to keep this project going. We made an international collaboration real, even as the world shut down. This is a victory for Open. You can find us on social media. On Instagram, we are Open Ed Influencers. On Twitter, at Open Influencers. On YouTube, at Open Ed Influencers. Our university's slogan is change the world. So come join us and let's do this together. I'm going to stop sharing this screen very briefly so that I can play something else for you. We're really excited. I just got to do this yesterday in conjunction with a local um, performer, artist, entertainer, and cultural anthropologist. And uh, his name's Conrad Koch. You are most welcome to go out there and to explore um, at Chester Missing on Twitter. If you don't mind, it would be a good idea if you put your speakers up just a small bit. Can you see my screen, firstly? Yes, we can. Thank you, Alan. And so let's do this. Hi there, my name is Conrad Koch. I'm a social anthropologist and well-known political satirist. And I have a question. Are you a puppet for education? What, did you say puppet? Yeah, puppet for education. No, and also, I'm also hosting this event. We're doing this together. No, I'm doing it. Guys, I am super excited. My name is Chester Missing. Come see innovation in education. Yeah, in real life, in the influencing open education online colloquium. Mm. It's going to be fantastic. I'm very excited. The three themes this year are hashtag disrupt, hashtag decolonize, and hashtag develop. It's presented by the Open Education Influencers at Nelson Mandela University, chaired by Gino Franzmann. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be amazing. And it features leading impactful educators from national and international spaces, okay? And the aim is to profile, I'm saying it, sorry. The aim is to profile those changing the ways we learn and teach. It's on the 17th of November from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's online. It's free, that's the best part. And you sign up by emailing openedcolloquium at mandela.ac.za. A Zoom link will be sent to you a day before the event. Invite your friends and anyone and everyone who is interested in social justice. That means you, Helen Zilla. Don't mention Helen Zilla. I don't care, you're the one she's gonna tweet. Anyone who's interested in social justice, access to education and professional development, you gotta be there, oh yeah. Come join us, like Nelson Mandela Uni's slogan says, change the world. That's right, change the world. 
Oh. So from us, um, yeah, I think that that's what we have to offer for you this evening. It's gotten really dark in the meantime. I look as if I'm a vampire. So from Molia and myself, thank you for joining us. And we're welcome to have some questions. If Eva, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was just a wonderful uh, presentation and uh, so rich um, resources and um, uh, really inspiring, um, um, really. So um, there have been a lot of appreciation in, in the chat. Uh, everyone is saying it's great, excellent, uh, keep going, um, etc. And I love the presentation and the initiative you have. Uh, we had from, um, uh, let me see, it was from um, Earl Mentor, who said that um, uh, this course has certainly challenged um, I'm, I'm do, uh, me to do better for myself and for the communities we work in. Uh, I'm wondering, can we, uh, can we have a voice to, to uh, Armando maybe to explain maybe more what um, uh, the impression was? Is that possible, Alan? If you, if you like, uh, Earl, Mentor. Yeah, if Earl wants to speak up. Hi, Eber. Um, I'm not sure if you all can hear me. Yes, it's fine. Yes, we can. Yeah, um, I've been actively involved within high risk communities in Cape Town and just uh, partaking in the online course of becoming an open education influencer have really added positive value in what we are set out to do to engage um, at risk communities positively. And it's been a powerful process up until now. So I'm deeply grateful. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this and for the testimonial. I think it was uh, just great. And uh, what I can understand also from your comment and from um, what, uh, what you have told us is that um, the way you have, uh, have developed this and uh, the, way, the way you are doing it, you really um, empower uh, the people to be engaged, to be involved and to take the ownership to to see the value instead of you know take uh, talking about policies uh, definitions blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. but really to 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 listen to the people and to take the people's uh, view and then you provide all this kind of wonderful um, uh, services and uh, development um well thank you eva well, thank you all Seeing any more questions, but maybe uh, um, to hold it for a little bit while. But um, what um, um, I mean, you have presented to us a great initiative, which uh, maybe can be scaled up, but maybe can be adapted and um, implemented in other places, other regions, other cultures. So, um, if I could ask you. Um, what is your advice to us how to um, go forward with such an um, initiative about the open education influences for the for the learners for the people? How Thank to get you, and, and I, yeah, I appreciate the question. I think that we all need to start from um, a place of awareness and insight. So, you know, take the course yourself, um, see what's there. It, it's difficult to advocate for something when you don't know exactly what that something is okay. and how and how it actually affects you or impacts you. And then you can start and see how it could impact other student um, people. So this is not just for students. This is also a staff development tool because we keep sort of coming up to these uh, barriers in in the implementation of open education resources into the curriculum and also into praxis, which is, which is such a big challenge globally. So I think that staff need to be empowered so that they have some sort of confidence, like you're not going to teach somebody Excel on a on, on sort of professional level if you are unable to engage in Excel on a professional level. Likewise with Open, you need to be empowered yourself before you can empower anyone else. So that's one thing. Um, then another thing is to deploy to students. I think our students are much more active and eager to get involved in innovative sort of processes and activities than we give them um, credit for. And we should stop having that sort of mentality that students are these empty vessels waiting to be filled. 
students are full of ideas and opportunities and just, you know, innovation, really. And what we need to do, perhaps, like to, to help them is to be innovative. You know, it, it's all inside of them. We just need to give them roots and, and sort of resources that's going to help them to unleash onto the world. But that's why we have advocacy, because we don't want them to do this and be harmful. That's why we have Ubuntu, because we want this to come from a place deep inside, a place of care. That's why we have facilitation, because we don't want them to do something in, in, in a way that's going to sort of damage what their intention is. So I think that the impetus um, coming from having engaged with this course is something really valuable. And um, as you said, yes, it can be translocated. It can be put into another culture. That's why it's an open education resource. We want you to take this material and we want you to recreate, to remix, to use those five R's. But likewise, we want to add the six R, which is now recognition. And I think that we need to start recognizing that both students and staff who engage with open are really walking into the future through action. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, comprehensive uh, reflections. Yes, I, yes, I think you are totally right. I mean, to really see that to, uh, it, it is very much a, of a, a empowerment. Learning is about uh, intrinsic motivation and also the joy of learning, which we sometimes forget. But you have really shown a wonderful example about uh, the, the issue of the joy of learning and engagement and ownership and uh, exactly what you have been talking about to, to involve and not to, to maybe see we or them, but to work together with the learners. So it's important to learn to know your learners. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful initiative. Uh, any more questions? I can't uh, see more than uh, appreciations and good points. And uh, it's a key principle to adult learning theory to, to really apply, which really applies to all students to with engage, engagement. And to make it also simple and easy and um, achievable. Um, just one thing before um, uh, we let you go, uh, I got a note that the link for this um, um, uh, was not working. So maybe if you just can write it in the in the chat, uh, that was the link about. Um, uh, let me see which link it was. Um, this influence. Um, let me see. Um, Uh, the engage uh, the, about the, the engage um, link it was not working. When you do this, then please use HTTPS, not just HTTP. Okay, can you please maybe write it in the chat so we get it uh, correct correctly? No problem. That's because I think people were uh, interested in, in that. And um, uh, while you're doing that, um, please note that you can also save the chat um, with those uh, three dots um, uh, so you can have it in, in your files. You can say, save all the interesting links we, we share there. Uh, and also, if you haven't done it already, please uh, upload your, your presentation in the, um, in the platform. And uh, also, please uh, stay in touch with this wonderful initiative and um, learn from it. So by, by that, uh, thank you so much, um, both um, uh, Gino and uh, Malaya for this wonderful presentation. And thanks for being with us uh, at this uh, session. Thank you, everyone. We'll try to stay on a bit longer. I don't promise that we'll be here for the whole evening though. Okay. So okay. thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's see. Um, in case we have uh, had any newcomers uh, during the first presentation, a warm welcome to, to all of you again. We are now having our second presentation by um, Professor Jaco Oliviers, who is an UNESCO OER chair, uh, ODL chair, sorry. Uh, uh, and his presentation is about uh, open trans languaging in, um, as international internal localization towards inclusive and equitable access of quality OER. And you are also coming from um, South Africa. A warm welcome to you, Jakob. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Eba. It's, it's a privilege to be here. And I already feel at home after listening to, to Gino and our colleagues there from the south of the country. Um, I'm always envious when, when 
uh, talking with them because they've, they've got this wonderful scenery where I'm currently based in, in Northwest. It's fairly dry and I always joke that we are uh, a lot closer to the desert, we, a lot closer to the Kalahari and, and the Namib. Uh, so it's very warm and dusty this time of year. But it's a privilege to be with you colleagues and I hope that what I will share with you will be enriching and, and worthwhile. Uh, I also want to uh, give a shout out to the other colleagues there uh, from the rest of the country. I see some colleagues from uh, University of Cape Town and so on. So it's, it's wonderful to uh, um, be in this company. Um, colleagues, first of all, uh, as Prof. Eva indicated, um, I'm going to talk about translanguaging and localization in terms of OER and, and something that we are starting with at Northwest University. Um, but I just want to give you some context and give you some uh, more information about how I see uh, these concepts before I unpack what, what we've, we've done uh, empirically. Um, I just want to also make a comment that in the chat box I will add the link to the presentation. So if you cannot wait, you are welcome to, to, to look at the spoilers so long. Now, as I said, I'm in uh, Mahiking. Uh, uh, I will show you a map later on where this is located. But I, I put this picture on uh, of, of this campus to uh, remind myself to say that the reason why localization is so important for us um, at Northwest, but for me also as a researcher and as a lecturer at Northwest is the fact that we, uh, we live in a multilingual country and we are in a very multilingual university. Um, we also very um, famously known to be uh, um, in a contentious position when it comes to language because we've got a very strong uh, uh, trilingual uh, language policy um, where most of the institutions in South Africa has opted for English. We still very strongly um, encourage the use of, of Afrikaans and Setswana as additional languages. One of the few universities where we've got a full degree in uh, teaching uh, that can be followed through the language of Setswana, which none of the other universities can, can brag about. We've got a very extensive um, program of interpreting. So multilingualism is very important for us uh, for many reasons. And uh, one of the issues that come up when it comes to resources is the fact um, that we, we quite often need to translate resources, but that also involves the whole process of uh, localization. So um, this is all about perceptions about university students, and we were working with African language teachers. Now, this is part of a broader project. This was one of the initial phases. And at this point, I, I must also give credit to my other colleagues in the, in the, in the broader project, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Nguenya, Dr. Matome, Mabilecha, and coming in, uh, Dr. Dorit Lavani and Dr. Queen Motsepe. So we are a wider group, but they were not involved in this part of the project. Um, we are working um, towards doing a lot more with uh, the African language teachers, uh, teaching students rather, I should say, uh, at our university. Uh, I mean, within the Faculty of Education, uh, Prof. Eva mentioned earlier that I'm the UNESCO Chair, and the UNESCO Chair uh, for uh, Multimodal Learning and Open Educational Resources is actually uh, situated when, within the Faculty of Education. So myself and my colleagues are very much involved in teacher training, and that's why we've, we've been working with student teachers. So what we wanted them to do, to give you a brief sense so that you can understand uh, as I go along, is we wanted the student teachers from who will ultimately become language teachers to create uh, open educational resources in their mother tongues. Because they um, have got this additional interest in the language and will also have um, further developed, um, if I can call it that, uh, a language abilities and interest and, and there's another type of motivation we've actually seen it and but I'll, I'll talk more about that later on another issue that comes in is the whole issue of translanguaging but i will explain more why this is pertinent for this discussion um this presentation is guided by a couple of questions so what would open translanguaging as a form of internal localization involve uh, and what practical steps would, would this involve? And I will give you some practical guidelines towards the end. Um, so translanguaging is, is not a new concept. Um, it comes from Wales, there's a whole history around it. And it, um, uh, you can see Garth Garthia's uh, definition there. She is really the, 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 uh, the, one of the main authors in the field. But in, in Wales, they had this idea that you can, in a classroom, 
mix. And, and for them, it was very much a bilingual situation, the language between teacher and student and swap it around at different times. These days, we view this more as a strategy that can be used in the educational context to be understood. And a lot of students do that automatically. A lot of learners at school do that automatically in the South African context. As I said initially, we are a multilingual uh, country. And quite often in education, I saw that even when I was still a teacher before I joined the university, that students would, would use any and every language and any and every variety even. Uh, especially these, these uh, developing urban varieties pose interesting possibilities for education. But nonetheless, translanguaging is, is using what you've got to understand best what is going on around you in, for, for the sake of learning. But then uh, one of uh, our very outstanding colleagues from uh, the University of Witwatersrand, uh, Professor Leketi Makalela, came up with the whole idea of Ubuntu translanguaging. I'm so glad uh, Gina already mentioned Ubuntu, because Ubuntu is, if Ubuntu is infused in the educational culture and UK, the educational philosophy of South Africa. It's not just me and myself, it's that we learn through each other and that it's a, a collective, a communal action. And uh, dear Professor Makalela has taken this concept into translanguaging as well. So for him, this is instances where speakers have acquired more than two languages simultaneously, which is common in South Africa, and where there's more than one language of input and output in the discourse of for meaning making. And he brings, if you read uh, his work, that communal aspect uh, to the table as well. And for me, that is, this is important, even in a language classroom, but in any university classroom, is to involve the language resources that we have in front of us from the students. Many lecturers are very afraid of that, and they would opt for the safe, safe option, which is English. And I think that is really detrimental. We need to learn more about each other's languages in order for this to, to, to be very successful. And unfortunately, that is, I think, one of the hampering uh, um, uh, points at this point. However, when it comes to resources, this can be done without the lecturer being able to understand the languages. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. I've proposed the concept of open translanguaging, where students utilizing their own, their individual and communal linguistic repertoires for the sake of open education. Um, in this process, we also talk about localization. I'll explain in a moment what localization is according to people who know better than me in terms of open education. Um, I want to talk about internal and external localization. And, and uh, internal localization for me is something that the students do. External localization is something that um, the typically the lecturers would do. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat there. So if you're really interested in this, you can see um, some of the ideas I have on that and they are still developing. Uh, and it's not just my own, it's, it's built on the whole um, uh, scholarship of localization. Something that I forgot to mention is that I started my academic career as an applied linguist. Uh, I studied at an undergraduate level translation studies. I even did a little bit um, of master's level translation studies in, in Denmark at some point. So um, translation studies, applied linguistics, uh, uh, unfortunately affects anything that I see. Uh, it's only when I moved to my PhD that I moved specifically into education, but I still have that view. And that's why my view of localization is not merely um, as shallow as we change the content. It's very much a linguistic and a cultural thing. But then, nonetheless, um, uh, our dear friend Teller Mill says that an often ignored barrier to remix and revision is English language of Western bias. And we need to be particularly cognizant of that. And that's why we need localization. Um, we need to address the hegemony of, of knowledge from the West and the global North, especially in South Africa. Um, we had student protests against uh, um, a Western uh, Northern based curriculum asking for a decolonized curriculum. And this is where localization comes in. Um, one needs to consider uh, the whole issue of linguicism. Um, Philipson talks about how English actually um, stamps out other languages and that we've seen that in South Africa definitely um, in, a, in a formal status level. Um, the need for cultural appropriate and situated learning is, is very important for me. And my own research has shown that that is totally ignored, but OERs are actually making uh, possibilities open for the sake of localization. That's where the idea of open pedagogy comes from, that democracy, the participation, 
bringing in the student voice and the student's language in that voice. But consider the, the whole issue of clarity of language, learning and teaching. And, and quite often, as I say, that is fairly much uh, English based. If you look at the literature, there's a distinction between adaptation and localization. Adaptation is main, merely changing the content, while localization specifically looks at the format and the language of it. Uh, Wolfen and Adinolfi says it better than I can. For them, it's adaptation of the content, where it's made relevant, and also translation. And with translation, it brings so much uh, to the table um, as it is. So Wiley and, and colleagues also said that localization is uh, most important, but also least understood elements. And that's why it's so interesting for me to try and understand what's going on with localization. Uh, Oates and Hashimi also say that rendering content in other languages also ensuring the technology is appropriate. And uh, even UNESCO supports this idea of making it more culturally and linguistically relevant. Um, uh, Gino mentioned the six R and I want to challenge him. Um, in 2020, I said there's another six R and um, one of the uh, uh, worst and best reviews of an article I ever had was when, um, uh, uh, what is his name now? I've forgotten his name. But one of our dear colleagues there from Canada said that, um, that the articles uh, is fairly mediocre, but at least the the, 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 the six R is, is worthwhile. Um, I will uh, maybe I shouldn't say his name, but one of our dear colleagues said that if you Google that the um, contextual um, quote, you might get it. Um, for me, that's very important. I, I think if we need to talk about retain and revise, decontextualize is very important. That's where we get to internal and external localization. In the interest of time, colleagues, I'm just going to move a bit. Um, you are welcome to, to read this slowly afterwards. Um, the principles of localization are a type of things that we consider throughout our process, um, that it must involve the locals, the students. Uh, we cannot send off a translation all the way to wherever. And we had a situation, um, one of the, the, the classes we used was an Isuzuru class. And one of the translators we used um, as part of the bigger project is sitting actually in, in uh, the province of KwaZulu-Natal. And But they are actually culturally removed from our students. Our students sit in Gauteng in the Northwest province, uh, just to give you a sense. Um, it's posted by community of practice, uh, practice, appropriate formats, and also a proportional understanding of local context. Um, I've given this checklist in a couple of places, um, and that this guided uh, what we scaffolded with the students in, in, in terms of creating the OERs. Um, just where we are before I talk about the methodology and what we found. I'm situated there, uh, you can see right at the top uh, in Mahiking. It's just on the border of Botswana. If I drive about half an hour that, that direction, I will be in another country in, in Botswana, wonderful country. Uh, and, and this area is, is predominantly a Setswana speaking area, but our university, as I said, is fairly multilingual, as you'll see in a moment. We spread over th three different campuses, um, which also adds uh, another dimension. And we've got a very strong di uh, distance education uh, component as well. Um, but you can see there the, the number of students, just, over, just under 60,000 students, I should say. Um, and we've got three residential campuses. Obviously now everyone is a, a distance student, but we, we do have a dedicated distance component as well. Most of the students involved in this study were actually real distance students. Uh, so they are quite older than the typical university student who's 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, most of them are uh, in, in their forties, if I should say uh, on average, um, already in the teaching profession, um, and they, they are studying by distance, obviously, um, to improve the, the, the teaching qualifications or whatever. Um, qualitative study, we looked a little bit at the OER artifacts. Um, I'm not reporting too much on that today. I'm focusing more on the reflections and the semi-structured interviews. It's part of a larger project where we look at the self-directedness and we're also looking at the open learning ecologies, which is a lot more than just merely uh, the, the phase of localization, it, 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 it pertains a lot to the, uh, um, the learning process and, and openness in that. Um, and that's part of the UNESCO chair's work. You can see there the university's language distribution. Afrikaans is still very prominent because we have a lot of residential students there um, studying through that medium. Setswana so fairly uh, prominent as well. The other uh, it includes students who opt not to indicate their language, and it includes also students from um, other countries. Um, 
as well as uh, I don't think it includes minority languages necessarily. So I think most of it is students who opt not to indicate. And strange enough, the, the next one is Isi Zulu, followed by Isi Tosa and Sesutu, which is also a prominent language on our Van Abel Park campus. So very multilingual. And, and um, for this study, the main uh, two groups were students who are studying um, Sepedi or Sesutu Salabua, Northern Sutu is the language name. And the other language was um, Isi Zulu. Um, I unfortunately cannot go into the, the reason why Sisutu Lasalabua has got three names. That's maybe a, a nice story for another time. So you can see um, mainly two groups. That doesn't mean that those students are actually mother tongue speakers of those languages. So they, do keep that in mind. Quite often, they might be uh, speakers of languages within that language family. And because of languages being fairly close to be understood um, for the sake of our colleagues there in the north, um, let's say Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish, that would be how Isizulu and Isitosa and um, say, for example, Siswati or Sidnebele would be um, relatively close enough to each other that with some studying, you can actually understand it and you can actually teach those languages as, as, as a subject, especially Isizulu because it's so big, it's, it's very uh, popular. Um, and from that group, 83 students took actively part in this process and gave consent for our for the OERs to be included in the research. The rest did the OERs, but they, they, they were not included in the research at all. Um, I'm going to show you some of the quotes from the discussion with the students and from their reflections and so on. And that will give you a sense of how they feel about it before and as they progressed through the process of creating OERs. And uh, we had two steps. First of all, creating OER for your language in the language subject. So they created text with comprehension questions and so on. So that was fairly original. And then also creating OERs that they localized. So they had to search for something, localize it. In other words, tra translate it into their language and make it relevant for their context. Um, problematic, as you can see here, in many of the African languages in South Africa, there are not a lot of resources available. Um, they are fairly optimistic and they want to take part. They want to create. And something that I found, uh, and I'm reporting about that in a, in a chapter that will hopefully appear somewhere next year, um, is that this happened very much along language lines. I got the sense, and if I can say it there, um, that the Isi Zulu speaking students were a lot more passionate about creating and, and uh, creating resources to maintain their languages than even the students who were speaking uh, Northern Suchia were. Uh, and that's an, uh, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, and I do think I have an idea, a theory why that is, but I think um, it, it's something interesting that if you can foster a love for language, that can be a, a positive thing towards promoting it as, as a language of learning, learning and teaching and for creating OERs. Um, you can see the, the, the colleague comments there as well. People fluent uh, in knowledgeable in two languages could contribute positively to the creation of learning resources, one of the students said. And that is essential. Whenever you work with localization, you need to have sufficient language, uh, knowledge of the language of the original resource and your target resource that is being localized. And that is quite problematic, even for these students who are language students who are really into this. For even for them, we got issues where they would say, I don't feel uh, uh, that I have sufficient knowledge of my language to create this, um, especially if, if the resource is for a subject that they don't know that well. We, we, we try to guide them to use the, one of the uh, main subjects. All of these students have to choose at least two main subjects that they will ultimately teach. So it might be Isizulu and natural sciences or Isizulu and uh, life orientation or Isizulu and geography or whatever the case might be. Um, so, Another one said there, because I don't understand the Isi Zulu academic language enough to create resources, hence I translate most of my information to English before submitting. And that is then in their normal uh, uh, way of doing. Um, most sources are available in English now. I was finding it challenging to translate from English to Isi Zulu. We realized early on that we need to scaffold translation theory concepts with these students. And that is quite daunting. daunting. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I taught uh, translation studies as well for a bit. And even there, I realized this is a three-year exercise. And we cannot do this with these teachers uh, or student teachers. 
And other students said, my wish is that sources be made directly available in Isuzulu. It should be books originally composed in Isuzulu, not those interpreted. So there were a sense, uh, you know, amongst the students that um, it could have been better if this was originally done in the language, is not something that they had to derive. Learning such deep Isuzulu, and that concept refers to um, uh, rural, uh, fairly traditional Isuzulu energized me a lot. And I learned new approaches that I can use in the class as a future teacher. So in our process, we al allowed the students to first of all, localize the resource. Then they would have a peer review process where uh, other students would evaluate and give comments. And then we uh, would involve the lecturers to provide feedback to them in, in order to um, you know, optimize the quality of the resource. All the time I teach myself uh, new words and I can use in reading and writing by reading novels and poems and dictionaries, etc. So they, this led to, and we didn't plan that, for students to actually do what they're supposed to be doing, and that's improving their language. Um, I'm just going to jump on um, to the recommendations. Um, in short, from the process, and this is still ongoing, and colleagues, and we will uh, only be moving towards publishing this online with an open license um, at the end of this year, um, but some recommendations I can say at this point is that translanguaging with OER should be supported and encouraged by classes, perhaps by even by means of annotations on OERs. Um, I do suggest that people work within the field of, of their expertise and in their languages. Uh, the harmonization of resources in related languages is really essential for South Africa, where we can group languages along family lines because students tend to understand uh, uh, those resources easier, but there's, there's research to be done in this that we know, know whether this is worthwhile or not. Sharing terminology, um, we are involved with a couple of proje projects at Northwest where we're actually sharing and, and, and um, uh, putting in repositories uh, multilingual terminology lists. And of course, Creative Commons licensing or any open licensing is essential. And that's what we did with these students as well. Um, start locating in teams. This is basically the, the, the procedure we followed, uh, preferring and scaffolding student skills. And um, if we have to do this again next year, we will know a lot, lot more on what, how to scaffold this. Uh, language needs and audits are very important. Students must identify relevant OERs. We've got the group. Um, and ideally, one would want lexicographical and language experts there, but we don't have that many of them. And then adapting, translating, quality check, and publish with an open license, and then you can go along. So open translanguaging in closing depend on language and access realities. A big issue, even in COVID, it's, it's even worse. Students don't always have the opportunity to have internet access, to have access to a device. One of the, the students noted that I can only do my OER uh, work when my mother is at home from work because we've got one tablet at home. Students are motivated and generally positive towards open translanguaging practices. More support would be necessary from the community, lexicographers and language practitioners. And as I said, we don't have enough. We don't have, en have enough students even studying in that field. Language standardization and language variety issues need to be considered. Uh, we realized very early on that the Isizulu used by our students is not the same Isizulu being used by language practitioners from outside. Artifacts show promise, but quality control is essential uh, whenever that is published outside. So this is the preliminary uh, findings and it gives you a sense of what we are busy with in terms of um, translanguaging and localization at Northwest. Uh, but that's, thank you from my side. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jakob, for this uh, wonderful presentation. It is uh, so important. And I'm so happy that you brought it uh, to the table. Um, I can't more than agree. Uh, on everything, and not at least as um, I'm coming from a less used, uh, from a country with a less used language, uh, Swedish. Uh, so I know exactly the problems. <laughs> and it has been an issue for a rather long time. And um, um, I will say that uh, there are, um, we are advocates who really see uh, problems with OER, as those are mainly uh, when it comes to, to human rights and social justice and equity, because most of the, the OERs are in English. And they also see that there may become some kind of new colony, uh, language colony, colonialism or 
I can't really pronounce it, <laughs> but you understand what I mean. And that is really a danger. Uh, it really is. And um, uh, as has been here in the chat as well, many have written and um, applause to presentation because language is not just about the words. It is about uh, the history where we come from, how we interpret things, uh, how we uh, about our values and norms and traditions and the culture. And um, although if you maybe um, uh, translate things, uh, it doesn't mean the same because it is just about words. Um, so. Um, it is really, really important. And uh, as we are on this OER, um, uh, the conference with the, with the focus on the OER recommendation, I also would like to take the opportunity to argue for how important it is to translate uh, the recommendation. We did it in, in my country in Sweden. And since we did that, it is much more easy. And of course, we didn't just translate it word by word, but we really contextualized it in also. And since we did that, and now when we talk about it, it is so much easier for people to understand the value of the OER recommendation from UNESCO. And, and that is just one example. Um, but um, yes, um, uh, how to address any questions for you? Because this is really a tough uh, issue. <laughs> um, because let me see if there are some questions. I couldn't really see see any there are direct question more that uh, what what I've just been uh, talking about about that language is so much more than the words and how we really uh, need to to be serious about that if we are talking about equity and, uh, and human rights and social justice for quality learning materials. Um, so how shall we? I take this uh, further on. I know that there, there has been, for example, the one project by ICDE and also some other organizations some years ago about uh, less used languages and OER. I think you know that study as well. And there have been um, also several other others um, after that. But how should we really um, uh, address uh, those important uh, questions and issues? You have, of course, shown a lot of good examples how we can make it but it needs to um, be upscaled and it needs to, to really be focused. Um, and it's more suggestions from your side, uh, Jaco, how we can um, work on this? Yes, no, definitely. I think um, from our side, we're going to start with the languages that we service at, at, within our faculty. Luckily, because we've got the strong um, distance component, we, we cover a lot of languages, especially the um, languages from the region, so um, the Sutra languages are well pr uh, presented and also Nguni languages, and to a lesser extent, uh, but that's that's the main, uh, I think, uh, issue, is that uh, minority languages like Chivenda, Hitsonga are not really represented at, at most of the universities, and that will be the, the challenge, and I hope that we can ultimately work with other universities to do that. But yes, I think we'll, we'll, we'll try and, and set an example and see how, how this works, and ultimately, our, our focus is, is creating resources for, for teachers, you know, and that's where the need is the most acute. Not necessarily for higher education. We're not there yet. Um, I think we, that's going to take a while, but that'll be the next step. Um, I, I think, and I mean, uh, Isizulu has got more speakers than um, if you combine uh, Danish and Norwegian and Iceland together, and you know how many publications are done in those, those languages. So... Um, I think it's possible. We just need to empower uh, the colleagues. I just want to see, uh, Chrissy noticed, uh, noted there that we must make use of translation students. And that's an issue. There aren't enough. We don't have translation students working in, in these languages specifically, not at our institution, maybe at others. And um, for another project that we are uh, sponsoring at, at Northwest, we are struggling to get lexicographers to work with um, us in, in projects. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but we will we'll get there. Mm. Thank you. Yes, that is also um, again. Uh, we need to work together with uh, with the students uh, for the students' uh, best. There is um, a comment from Dino and also from Chrissy about uh, Gojian OER uh, network who had um, done a picture storybook, and this is um, about thirty translations already. And uh, this is an open uh, open source. So or everyone is welcome or welcome to to add and continue with this work so it's a great work um, 
from this uh, network, Gaudian OER. Um, yes. Um, so again, um, to really work on equity and inclusive inclusion, this is uh, an issue we, we need uh, to take seriously uh, to work on if we are going to uh, implement the OER recommendation because it's so important. So thank you for bringing this uh, uh, to discussion. And um, um, I see that you have your link here in the, in the chat, but please also um, put it in the uh, platform. For those who are not here with us in this session, it can be of interest for others. And also, if you have other links or materials, so the uh, conversation and the dialogue and the advocacy about it can continue. So, thank you very much again. Excuse me, Ebba. I think Gino was had his hand raised. Oh, sorry, story. sorry. I did. I did, okay. can't see. I can't see an, all the all the pictures so, of you. So I'm here for so, you. So, Gino, please. Thanks, Eva. Thank you, Yaku. As always, um, thrilling presentation and amazing work that we see further up to the north of the country um, that really spans the, the width and the breadth of, of our community, of our population. So thank you for all of that. Um, just because people did sort of um, respond to the post about the Goji in OER picture storybook on our page on OEG Connect, you are able to physically go there and add a translation, it's 174 words. You are able to take five minutes out of your time and create a version of the storybook in your own language, just there. It's an interactive asynchronous activity here. So like Chrissy says there, exactly anybody can do it. And if you don't yes. want to translate, you can make your own storyline. Thank Very you. Very good, thank you for sharing that, uh, you know. Very good. So again, uh, make use of this uh, lovely platforms to, for the um, uh, conversation and the dialogues and the contributions. Um, the more we can advocate, the stronger we can build the open community. So by that, um, I will go next um, to, to the next presentation about open education cooperative, a learning, um, e-learning and openness. And that is by um, Alexandra uh, Szetwertynska from uh, Centro Sytrowda in Poland. So the floor is yours, uh, Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. And I will just share my screen. Yes, please. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to talk about our project we um, create and conduct it for four years now. So uh, it's, uh, for me, it's a long way back. Uh, and uh, I want to just show how, how it's changed and uh, um, what we changed during this, uh, this long process and um, how we still work on this uh, cooperative uh, part of it and uh, where is the open education in this educational project. Um, I'm working in uh, Centrum Cyfrowe, this is uh, in Poland, Warsaw. Uh, we are basically um, talking a lot about uh, new technologies and uh, digitalization and uh, how how these new technologies and internet could be uh, can be um, more uh, how to how to put it in nice good words more for people not for just technologies <laughs> I, I think that it would be the right uh, right way to say this so we are just thinking about this human part and that um, in in all these innovations and all this digitalization, um, yeah. Also about teachers, students. Uh, our organization works not only in education but also in um, with uh, cultural institutions. So uh, and a little bit, maybe not a little bit, but we have also some um, policy department in uh, in our NGO. It's the foundation. Uh, but I'm a uh, chief of open education in our uh, 
organization. And I will just say uh, our story, our ad story. When I came to this uh, Centrum Cyfrowe and I started thinking about how to make this open education in Poland more uh, open and real and how to use this policy work because before me we had huge legacy in Poland of this policy work and we have um, open textbooks and we have very nice um, um, exception for uh, education so uh, everything is free uh, basically mostly uh, in Polish schools uh, to use uh, when it stay in classroom, that's very important, not online. <laughs> so, but if you use uh, any resources uh, in classroom, you can use everything uh, what you want. And uh, so this concept of open education was very hard to translate and to uh, to show um, to the teachers. I'm working uh, with K-12 uh, teachers mostly um and also librarians but i started with this uh, with the schools uh, and then we start to think that we need to we need to find this uh these areas the subjects that there is lack of uh, materials lack of resources and and we make research <laughs> and that's how we came that uh, to the conclusion that that uh, in Poland, there is a huge problem with uh, materials for mathematics, for mathematics, and um, and also we found Alfred North Whitehead. <laughs> he was a mathematician, and also he um, he was huge fan of education. He read some uh, in the beginning of twenty centuries century. He read. Uh, very interesting um, text, how this uh, education should be open and should be for everybody and should be equal. And that was crazy idea in the beginning of the 20th century, why equal and why for everybody? But um, he uh, he became like good, um, good soul of our of our project. And I like to come back to to, <laughs> to him and uh, remember that he was on the beginning of this uh, of this um, project. So we uh, we figured out that we need this great subject and then talk about resources that they need that this is important. But we didn't want to focus only on resources, but also on open education. So also about on methods and how to uh, work with kids and how to work with teachers. Um, because we 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 know as a fact that this uh, this group is really um, uh, it's easy to work with because they like to to learn, but uh, also uh, they they feel lonely, they feel insecure, they not on, always believe in what they can do, and uh, that's what those were some uh, some hard parts of our project. And then we uh, we think that we need this four um, we we call this uh, ideas uh, this four big ideas for our uh, for our project and we start with cooperation because we know that teachers were very lonely and that it's hard for them it still is hard for them to cooperate in schools uh, between the schools between uh, uh, teachers and uh, students and this is something that you just need to need to learn so we start with this cooperation then we also think that this learning part uh, not only teaching but learning for teachers are very very important because it's <laughs> it's always more interesting when you can get something it's not only you product this open education resources product product and that's it no it's interesting when you can see that you can learn during this process that's not only for your students of course it is but it's not only for them it's also for uh, it's also for you and also we thought we, we thought that this adventure part is quite important uh, because it it has to be fun, teaching and learning, <laughs> and school and also this uh, this uh, resources. 
we, we, we believe that they need to be pretty, <laughs> that they need to be, of course, in good quality. And also uh, this, uh, this open education should um, show different methods and different ways of learning and teaching. And this is our uh, adventure. And of course, on the end, openness. Everything what we create with our teachers uh, is open. <laughs> and we uh, we teach them uh, a lot about uh, open licenses and open education in in why even in Poland when we have this uh, this very nice exception uh, why it's so important for them to make all this this resources open for example it's easier to share you just can put on internet and then share with with your colleagues and this is our educa process so how it works uh, normally, of course, because it's four years and we have many um, small branches of this of this tree, but uh, basically it looks like this. We have uh, research for for sure uh, for for um, for fast, and it could be small research that we made in our own, or I will show you in the moment also um, international uh, research about open education in pandemic. It's different year, different research, but we always try to work on data and uh, on facts. It helps us not only to create something that's really useful for everybody, but also to um, uh, talk about this and to, to, to talk why it's so uh, important to make all these uh, materials open. So then after this research, uh, normally we choose one main topic that we are uh, we're going to be focused on this year. It was mathematic, it was psychological help in schools, it was climate changes, and this year we have local uh, projects. Where we work with teachers and they create their own projects in schools. Uh, so we are changing it a lot uh, during the years. Uh, then we uh, we meet our teachers, we, we make meetings for, for them and teach them and learn with them a lot of uh, tools, methods, uh, uh, whatever they need, like design thinking or Scrum or really what, whatever they need, what they have in mind and what they want to do, we just try to, uh, to, to put in our workshops. And then they create OER. <laughs> And uh, in their schools or during the workshop, uh, depends on the year. Uh, and also they create their own teacher networks in their schools or in librarians, it depends <laughs> with who you, we work. Uh, yeah, and because it's, it's very nice, but it's quite, to be honest, it's quite uh, expensive to work like this. So we have also, uh, online course uh, for librarians. And this is huge project for many uh, libraries. And we work with them uh, mostly online. Uh, and this is our way of, um, of make this, this project bigger. Uh, and also we were still uh, probably two years now in this way of translation. So that's why it was very interesting for me because we, we tried to translate in English our Polish course. So it's a totally different way of translation. And it's also very hard uh, to, to make it so much universal. And we really want to make it uh, good. So that's why we, we are thinking and we just collecting so many materials and it's hard to select the, the best one or the best one for our course. Uh, but yeah, we will have this online course sure uh, soon. Uh, I also want to share with you this uh, links because it's online now, but it's not exactly ready. <laughs> and then we also um, write the methodology because we really believe that it's quite um, this uh, this method is quite universal. It's maybe it's nothing very uh, unusual or very very innovative, but still it's working. It's very nice that we have this 
um, online version and this offline version for a pandemic, it's great. And that we have this teacher networks and librarians networks. This is this is amazing. There are there are so many people there that believe in our uh, in our project. Um, so that that's something. I believe it's because they have chance to do something just their own hands, <laughs> like they just uh, beginning to be creators, and that's important. That you really can. Um, uh, uh, can show, first of all, show to everybody, this is my work, this is my work, this open education resources that I made. Uh, so probably that's, that's why, and also because they have this, uh, this opportunity to talk to each other, to, uh, uh, to meet, just to meet, this is quite, uh, quite important, and to feel stronger after uh, all, this, uh, all this project. Uh, and this is also for me. This is like open education in uh, in uh, uh, <laughs> on the one page. <laughs> okay, so this research this year we just make uh, this uh, quite big research in seven countries about uh, remote education during the pandemic, and um, and and I have some. Oh, I don't have here this. Uh, uh, link, but I probably can go and okay, I have here. Um, yeah, um, yeah, this is the um, the uh, site of this uh, uh, this research. So I invite you to uh to read this it's quite interesting how this open education helps uh help during this pandemic and how it's so why it's so important to uh talk uh about about open education but also about uh, um, creative commons about uh, copyright law in schools because this is hard uh, um hard subject and also i will show you this uh yeah this is uh side of our course maybe here it's sorry you, you can't see because you see probably this <laughs> this is our course also i will um, put this uh, this link here for you you can look at this this course is about uh, of course co-creation uh open education resources uh so that's it. And one more thing, I just want to show it's in Poland, in Polish, but I just want to sh show you how this resources looks, uh, for example, because they're totally different in different years. But for, for example, it could be like just uh, Google Docs, because they believe it is most um, convenient for them. So it just uh, um, some scenarios for for lessons but it could be also i don't know how to go there yeah it could be also website why not it's website this is calendar it's, uh, you have september here for example it's kind of for uh, uh, mm, to work with students uh, like different uh, it's about a different uh, how to say, um, sorry, um, I forgot the word, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter. It's very nice, it's a huge work. Uh, we have these authors here, <laughs> so, these authors here, uh, they are all teachers and they uh, make amazing work uh, there. Okay, I think I finished my presentation, maybe I will just come back here for a second and um yeah and so yeah because we are there ah this might i just talk about this this is our yeah so and it's contact to me so i, I finished and uh, thank you for, very much for inviting me here i love to talk about our project <laughs> Yes, we can really feel that, Alexander. You have to love to talk about it because it's such a wonderful project, some project you have, and uh, the work you're doing at Centrum Sipona as well. I mean, in overall, it's a fantastic job. 
uh, I know it because I have been at your conferences uh, many times and worked together with you, so I can really confirm that. <laughs> So thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And um, I have seen in the comments and I will say myself as well, you had just lovely images for your slides. Uh, thank you, uh, yeah. As I said, it's very important for us to have it very is, nice it images. Is. They are all um, open resource, so I can share with you these images if you want. This. Uh... Yes, I think yeah, many will get, get inspiration. So um, please just um, in the chat, but also it will be good in the platform. To, yeah. together with your slides as well because i mean all of us uh, not at least uh, now during the pandemic uh, uh, we all have uh, contributions uh, online so we also not at least for ourselves sometimes we need to have some kind of variations <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that um, uh, that was a bonus <laughs> besides, the, besides the content you presented to us and i see here also that alan has worked with the british columbia open ed tech cooperative cooperative and they say that um, their motto is about um, contribution and not uh, contracts and i think that is a nice uh, approach um, because again as uh, also the other speakers have been uh, talking about it is um, you need to encourage people uh, to be motivated and uh, to be part in also if, if we know uh, are talking about uh, Trans transformation about uh, openness and the use of uh, open education resources uh, within the other four, the five areas. Um, we need yeah, to encourage people. Uh, sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, I think it's it's very interesting because uh, when I'm when I when we started with this project, I heard a lot. Why I why I am a teacher? I'm not here to make some materials. You know, you can pay me, and then I can create like five uh, uh, scenarios, and that's gonna be okay. And that's why we just start to talking to, to thinking. Okay, we just this uh, because they're right. If you yeah, it's just it's work. So they're right. So that's this is was the, the the moment when we start to think what we can give them. Yeah. And what they can find inside in them <laughs> to. Uh, to want to do this. And it's yeah, very yeah. important to, to make it clear that we are not paying. No, we are not paying, but it's not that uh, that you are doing something for us. And uh, yeah, it's really- Yes, you need to have this win-win situation. Uh, yeah. To, to um, that everyone can benefit from it and to, to gain some, uh, some something which is of value for, for the own person. It's very important because then you are committed and then you can take responsibilities. I mean, you, and you, first, of, first and foremost, you're not forced to, to do anything and, um, but you do it because, yeah, it's important to have fun as well. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, as we had said uh, earlier on, um, the, um, the chat will be saved and you can do it yourself as well with those uh, three dots in the right um, side of the, the chat uh, box, so you can copy to yourself as well, but it will be also saved in the platform together with this, this session. Uh, any questions from the audience uh, right away? Anyone who would like to say something in the chat or raise their hand or have the have the mic to to just uh, raise your question? Let me see if anyone is raising their hands. No, everything was so clear and um, and good. Um, so I think I will leave it uh, there for the moment and uh, come back in the in the end with some overall uh, questions for you. So our so thank you very much uh, again, Alexandra, for sharing this thank very, very interesting uh, work with us. Uh, well, I will say one thing more. Uh, you showed the, the report uh, from which you launched now in in um, was it in summer, I think. And also you dedicated your conference, your annual, an, annual conference, uh, Open Education Forum, which was online. You dedicated um, uh, that conference uh, to discuss this report as well. And you did it in a very, very good way because it is very important um, and uh, nice results you have uh, from those uh, countries involved. Actually, I was involved in that um, from the beginning. So I, when, when you worked on it and I also attended your conference, so it is, uh, I will recommend you um, to take a look at it um, uh, in the link and to, and to read it. And I think it can be useful for other countries to take on the lessons they learned from, from this research as well. 
So thank you for sharing that as well. Thank you very much. For, thank you for these words. Yeah, I think it's very important. And the most interesting, I guess, uh, the, the most interesting thing, I guess, is that you have these seven countries. It's not so much many teachers or this huge numbers, but there are so many different perspectives. And yes. then there are so much similar, similarities in this uh, research. So, yeah. Yes, there are both similarities, but also different differences. Uh, and, um, yeah. uh, so it is it's very nice um, narratives and, and uh, lessons learned. So our fourth presentation um, is from uh, uh, Mohammad Reza Tabakoli, Abdullah Farai, and uh, Gabor Kismihok, and it is about OER recommendations to support lifelong learning. And lifelong learning is uh, also, among other things, uh, really high on the agenda, I think, uh, worldwide uh, nowadays. Um, we ourselves in my country have got it in the um, higher in, in the, the guideline, the guide, not the, the guidelines, but the, the law for higher education. To, it is written now since uh, since the summer that universities should and have to work with lifelong learning in all means. And I think that is uh, for many other countries as well. I think the presentations will be by Ali Farahi. Is that uh, right? Or will you do it uh, together? Yeah, no, I will present. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So then uh, the floor is yours. And I'm please remember to put uh, the reflections and questions in the chat for uh, Ali. So can you see my screen now? Yes. OK. So, so hello, everyone. I'm Ali Faraji from uh, TIB Hannover in Germany. And I'm going to present you our uh, research project uh, named OER Recommendations to Support Lifelong life, life Learning. So first, we start with the motivation of our project. So if you go, around, uh, go ask around about the uh, annoying factors in current educational uh, education uh, of current education system and the experience which people have in this education system, they would refer to uh, lack of cre creativity and uh, excessive discipline. And uh, one of the most important ones is that it, lack, it lacks personalization. So it tries to teach uh, each and every person in the same way, which we believe is wrong. So we think that personalization, lack of personalization is actually one of the major flaws in current education system. And if we try to teach everyone with the same methods, you won't get a good result. Since people learn differently based on their context, based on their personal goals, uh, based on their preferences. For example, someone wants to get job A and he, needs, uh, he has different needs and uh, someone else wants to get job B and she has different needs. And um, for example, some people like books, some people prefer videos, some people prefer theoretical materials, some people uh, prefer practical materials. So this shows that learning context and personalization is so much important. So this told, uh, this being told that uh, uh, there is a lack of personalization in current educational system. So since uh, the skills required for jobs are changing rapidly and also there are uh, new content almost every day and everything is changing. So what are the new responsibilities of the people in the educational system? We can look at it from two perspectives. From the teaching side, we believe that teachers should uh, be updated, should update themselves regularly, should, they shouldn't be static, they shouldn't be just some person who comes to a class and gives some lectures. So uh, they should provide the students with educational recommendation based on each student's need. And they should also provide assessment services for them so that students can self-assess themselves to see that how much they, uh, they have learned and how much they like uh, the, uh, that area. And from the learning side, people, uh, learners should be able to set their goals. And, uh, Students shouldn't just be people who sit in a class and listen to the teachers. They should have interaction with the system. They should give feedback to the teacher. And um, actually, um, we should put the students in the driver's seat of the learning path. 
so that they decide that um, the path that they want to continue in their uh, learning. So, uh, as this, um, as uh, I've said, the new responsibilities and the problem with the current education system. Our general objective in this project is to empower learners through open, personalized learning and curriculum recommendations based on labor market information and OER. So we have labor market information. We know that what labor market needs. And uh, on the other hand, we have open educational content. We have lots of them, and we are going to empower learners using these two to provide a personalized learning path for them. So the concept overview of our project, the things that we want to integrate and implement um, is uh, shortly described in this picture. As you can see, it starts from goal setting. So if a learner comes to our system, it sets um, their goal. And um, then the system will try to automatically and intelligently extract a skill from that specific goal or job so uh, using the labor market information that we have, for example, ESCO data sets or all other vacancy announcements out there. Um, so it tries to recommend user that for this goal, you need to learn these skills. And then the user will create their own learning path using the um, suggested skills and their own learning objectives or their own preferred uh, curriculum structure. And when the path the learning pathway is configured, then we provide them with open educational resources which are available in those area and also institutional content, and they start learning. And after they um, learned um, the whole skill, a whole skill or half of it or any time that they want, they also have the possibility to evaluate themselves, to self-assess, to self-evaluate themselves to see where they are currently at. And this is a circular path so they can go back set a different goal or even get notified when a skill is updated so when a new requirement for a specific goal um, is defined out there so uh, this is actually a circular path that the skill that this, uh, a learner can follow and uh, it's completely built based on their own opinion so uh, in trying to integrate these uh, general idea, we have some research challenges, definitely. So the first one is dynamic nature of skill requirements. So as you probably know, the jobs nowadays uh, try to have many, many um, different skills in different areas, in different contexts, and the skills are also changing each year, each month, and even in some cases each week, and we have to be updated. So a system that, uh, that manually uh, tracks these stuff uh, will be behind. So we need to mine job vacancy periodically and try to be updated and extract a skill out of those job vacancies. So this is one of, the, uh, one of our major challenges. The second one is that after we get the skill, so we need to extract the topics that are needed to Covered the skill. So each skill, a skill is a general thing. So you need many, many topics in order to be a master of that skill. So extracting that topic uh, from the skills and also from the educational resources, from the OERs that we collect. So we collect OERs, some of them has metadata, some of them don't, and we have to extract that what are these OER about? What topics do they cover? This is the second research challenge. So uh, the other one is a huge amount of the educational resources, huge amount of the OERs out there. So we have to be, uh, we have to have a way to filter them. We have to assess their quality. So um, we have done some research on metadata quality, and we think that it's really important. It has a really strong correlation with the general quality of the content of the OER. And we have, uh, we have to also include the content, uh, content quality so that we would be able to filter and give the learners the best content that we already have. And on the other hand, we have to also extract the uh, OER's properties. For example, one of the most important ones is the cover topics, as I've already told, that uh, which topics are covered by these um, OER. And at the end, we need a recommendation engine so that uh, the learners uh, can have the best fitted OER 
so that they can learn better. So uh, we have created a, an open community-based AI-driven learning platform called Edur, and I'm going to show a demo of it, a short demo of it to you. So uh, this is our homepage, and uh, every person after registering and logging in has a dashboard. So uh, when you enter a dashboard for the first time, this is the first page that you will see. This is the learning preferences. So uh, as you can see, we are trying to create a profile burning ba based on your learning preferences. So we will ask you six questions regarding the educational content list, lens, and each of these have samples. So uh, you will know what we are talking about, the level of the detail. So low detail, medium detail, and high detail content type, theory only, examples only, or theory and examples, um, uh, multi-topic content. So some people like the contents that only focus on one topic, but some people don't. They want um, content that has multiple topics, class-based content, do you want a university class content or not? And uh, the last question is about the types, the, the content format that you prefer. You can rank videos, book chapters, slides, and web pages. And then when you save, the, your profile will be created in the system and the recommendation engine tried to use these stuff to recommend you the best OER that we have, we already have. So uh, the first thing after setting your preferences is setting your goals, as we have explained. So we have a goals page. Uh, let me delete the, the ones that I already added. So in the goals page, um, we call them high-level goals in the system. You can easily add um, goals from what we have, for example, data scientists in Python uh, uh, in the area of professional scientific and technical activities. Um, when we add these goals as one of our high-level goals, then uh, the, the path that we defined in the slide starts. So here is the goal. When we click on it, uh, the system has automatically extracted the skills which are required for the, uh, to achieve this goal. So these are the skills that are, uh, that are extracted from the job vacancies out there with crawlers and everything. So now I can create my own pathway by selecting the skills that I want to learn. For example, I want to learn machine learning with Python and text mining with Python as an example. So these are my target, target skills. And I can also add any other skills which I want, which is not related to my goal, or I think that is related, but the system did not recommend. For example, um, our programming language. And then I have three target skills. On the other side, I can even select a specific topic. So I just want to know a specific thing uh, Mm, for example, installing, I think, Python 3, just a specific topic, it's not a skill, but this way I can create and customize my own pathway, and I, I can give them priority, I want it to be higher, and then after I have defined my goals, so this is my high-level goal, and this is my curriculum, so my type of the skills, and my target topics, which are explained in the system, then I can go to Learn tab. So in the Learn tab, as it, it is loading, you can see that we have three skills to be learned. And all of them are at 0% because I have not started to learn them. But if I open each of them, you will see that the skill uh, is divided into many, many different topics. So in order to master this skill, which is the biggest skill, machine learning in Python, you have to learn all these topics, which are dynamically uh, extracted from the skill. And uh, so uh, the one which is yellow is the ongoing skill, and the blue are the future ones. So here is the recommendation. So you see an open educational content recommended for the supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. And if you click, you can watch it or uh, and afterward, you will, you will give feedback to the recommendation engine. You can say that, change it. I don't like, for example, the instructor. And the system will try to find another open educational content for you and recommend it to you. So for example, after watching this one, 
you can say, okay, I liked it and I'm ready to go to the next topic. Or you can say, I liked it, but I want another educational content. So we can also include feedback. And when uh, you try to go to the next topic, as you see, it starts blue. So it means that you have already uh, watched uh, one content for it and you liked it. And you have to give a small test so that you know that you are ready to go to the next topic. So you can um, give just uh, a small exam and go uh, to the next topic, which I didn't. And afterwards, after finishing um, one skill or not, you can uh, even come here and we have also exams which are dynamically generated based on the question banks. So you can say, I'm ready to take a test and uh, take a, a long test to see how well you can perform in this specific skill. And it also has the last records of your exam. And the part that we are currently working on is discovery part, which is a crowdsourcing part. So here people can give their opinion um, about a specific goal and then um, just edit, uh, suggest and reorder, suggest a deletion of a skill. And then if they go to inside the skill, they can suggest that how this can be changed and based on the votes of the community, then this skill, this topic, this content will be updated and people can add uh, their own educational content, their own OER to the system and everything will be uh, dynamically merged with what system has already learned through AL, AL algorithms and will be presented to the learners. So uh, this, uh, this stage is just in development mode, the discovery, but we are working on it. And it's almost, uh, it also uh, provides suggestions uh, for the uh, for data skills using the crawlers that we have and people can decide that um, these are relevant or irrelevant. So um, as you can see, we have implemented the, seri uh, the whole procedure inside our eDoor platform. And um, so our next step is uh, we want a scal a scalability. So we have decided to use crowdsourcing. We want to include other people to add content and give their opinions. We, will, we are also working to, add, um, to include uh, discussions so that people can discuss, discuss with each other that what they think is uh, correct, what they think is wrong. And we, have, uh, we are also working our, on our intelligent models, job skill, skill topic matching, and also the quality assurance is one of our ongoing research topics. And one of the future plans that we have is to capture the mental status of learners. For example, uh, is the learner tired? Is he, uh, does he learn better in the morning or is he happy? And then based on those of our recommendation engine can we, uh, recommend even better stuff. And also definitely we need to increase the number of our users so that we can get more feedback and um, improve our system. So thank you for your attention and please visit our prototype, uh, eduer.eu. So if you have any questions or comments, I would be glad to hear. Uh, thank you so much, Yari, for uh, this, this wonderful uh, presentation and um, sharing this um, initiative and system with us. Uh, first, of course, a, a question. So this is already implemented in the educational uh, institution? Um, yeah, but uh, it's uh, an ongoing project. So yeah, most uh, parts of the intelligence system is implemented, but we are still working on the crowdsourcing part so that we can collect uh, opinion of everyone. And we, we will also give some users the roles of experts and then people can contribute with special permissions and everything. So a two follow-up question to that. Um, so how did you manage to, um, um, to get this happened? Because I mean, um, education institutions, as we know, are not very flexible or uh, innovative or in, in this respect. So that was the um, first follow-up question. The second one is, of course, uh, about the learners. So what they, they, do they think about it? And the, how will that help their learning pathways? And I really appreciate it that you also in the future will also include um, 
um, the, the mental um, uh, and health aspects. That's uh, fantastic. So maybe um, you can just elaborate on those two issues to start with. Um, well, based on uh, the feedback that we have gathered from the users, they think that personalization is one of the most important features. And uh, according to the evaluation that we have done, uh, it seems that using our system increase the performance of learners so they can learn better when they're using uh, our system compared to um, the even compared to current uh, institutional online institutions, for example, Khan Academy or other institutions which have which has quality uh, assurance with manual quality assurance, I mean. And um, for, um, for, from the other side, uh, with innovation uh, and um, other points that you have mentioned for the learners. So here we let the students, we let the learner to choose their own path. So they can be creative, they can include what they want to learn and exclude what they do not want to learn. They can um, set their preferences to uh, not getting a specific content. And this way, not only they ha will have more motivation to learn, but also um, the area that they want to cover in order to reach their goal will be covered exactly on the boundaries. And this will save them time. And this will make them more happy that they are now able to um, learn something that they like. So I, uh, we think that this can solve many problems of the current education, which is mostly static. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, comments no in the chat is that uh, this is amazing. I can't wait to try it out. And the crowdsourcing will be a great addition. And this is a great resource. And also, what are uh, what are some of the main sources um, of the OERs other than YouTube? And then, of course, uh, there are follow up questions to that about um, uh, scalability and um, used in other contexts, and uh, as we talked about other languages and cultures as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so regarding the languages, we are currently working on it, and I think we will have them by the end of this week, actually. We are trying oh. to make a new release. So we will add a language not only to the interface, but also to the crawler so that they can detect different languages uh, with different OERs, and they can include them uh, inside the system. Uh, but uh, for the sources of OER, we think uh, I think we have used all the major uh, OER search engines which are already out there. Uh, for example, I don't remember them by name, um, but uh, it, it's not only YouTube. We have um, OER uh, I, OER Commerce. I don't know. I, I don't remember them uh, them by name. But there are many many sources. I think we have more than ten sources, uh, different search engine, different institutions. Uh, and uh, we are also working on crawlers to be able to detect new sources and gather data from them. Uh, a great initiative, which really um, empower inclusiveness and um, equity and um, internal um, uh, motivation and uh, empowerment and engagement, what we have talked about uh, for the whole session today. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so um, I think we have some links in the in the chat for the resources and uh, for you as well. Please upload your presentation and um, the links you have because uh, all of us we can't uh, wait to try it out. <laughs> Thank. I think that was a good uh, final word for you in, in by um, uh, in the comment in the chat. We can't wait to try it out. Um, so the next uh, and the last uh, presenter is uh, Christina uh, Riemann Murphy and Brian McGarry, and I think it will be you, Christina, who will present. Uh, um, maybe you are sharing, I don't know. Uh, it's up to you. And um, uh, the title of your presentation is about uh, the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap, Building Capacity to Create and Sustain Inclusive Learner-Centered Oh, we are. So we are very much uh, looking forward to your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Ali, for the link. 
but also please upload it in the in the platform if not already done so christina we can't wait to till to listen to you My apologies, everyone. Some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfect. No, 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 no. Take your time. Great. No problem at all. We're just so, we're just so keen, you know, to, to listen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Christina Riemann Murphy, and I'm the Sally W. Kiln Librarian for Learning Innovations and a reference and instruction librarian at Penn State Abington. Hi, I'm Brian McGeary. I'm the Learning Design and Open Education Engagement Librarian at uh, Penn State University. And we're looking forward to talking about the Open Pedagogy Project Management um, Roadmap um, and about building capacity to create and sustain inclusive learner-centered OER. So feel free, feel free, as you have been, to use the chat for questions. And if you're on Twitter, um, our, uh, you can use the hashtag OEP Roadmap. We'll turn it over to Brian. All right. Thank you, Christina. Um, so one thing that you quickly realize whenever you start learning about open pedagogy is that nobody can really give you kind of a, a definitive definition of what it is. Um, some people see it as this set of teaching practices, some see it as, as a learning style, some see it as more of like a, a set of values and a philosophy, a mindset. Um, and some people see it as a combination of all of these different things. Um, so on, on the slide here, uh, we have a few definitions that we think are useful to consider. I'm not gonna read through all of them, um, but these aren't necessarily the only good ones out there. Um, so just a, a few to kind of mull over to sort of uh, set the stage, if you will. Um, but, uh, you know, as we were uh, creating the, the roadmap, we decided that even if we weren't going to provide sort of a definitive definition of you know, this is what we think open pedagogy is. Um, we still, you know, felt that we needed to provide some sort of framing so that anybody who was uh, wanting to use this resource would know where we were coming from and what we were referring to when we're talking about open pedagogy. So we looked for uh, commonalities among all the different definitions that we've encountered um, through our work. And uh, you'll see those a few of those commonalities listed here on the slide. Um, so, you know, first of all, that emphasis on uh, engaging with students as creators of information rather than just being consumers of it. Also, the emphasis on that experiential learning component um, with, you know, students again being involved in this creation process. Uh, also, how that, you know, challenges classroom hierarchies. Um, so students are, are participating in, in the teaching process through that, that creation that they're doing uh, with instructors. Um, also the importance of moving away from single use assignments to uh, more situated collaborative and renewable ones. And then finally, uh, really important emphasis on uh, student agency, you know, being able to decide whether their work is going to, to be open um, and also being informed about, about uh, those decisions that, that they're making and, and licensing and all of that, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, momentarily. So in addition to the sorts of theoretical perspectives that, that we took away from the scholarly literature um, on open pedagogy, we also used a lot of our own personal experiences with open pedagogy in order to uh, inform our development of the, the open pedagogy project roadmap. Um, so we thought about different lessons that we've learned from those experiences and how those might be uh, more widely applicable to, to other folks doing open pedagogy projects. Um, you know, when, when we got involved with open pedagogy, there wasn't really a, a resource out there like this uh, to help us think through the, all the different aspects of this work and kind of planning out the projects. Um, so we had to you know, learn things as we went along through trial and error, which isn't always necessarily the, the best way. Um, so part of our motivation behind this resource is really to help others uh, avoid having to go through that, that, uh, that process of, of learning lessons on the fly. Um, so I'm first going to share a little bit about a project that I worked on, and then Christina is going to share about one that she continues to work on. 
um, so that you'll have a, a sense of where we're coming from and how our experiences have informed this work. Um, and then later, as we get into actually explaining the different modules of the roadmap itself, I think you'll see how elements of those experiences are reflected in the content of the uh, roadmap itself. So this open textbook project was created by uh, students in Dr. Ashwini Ganeshan's Hispanic Linguistics course at um, Ohio University, which is uh, where I used to work at. Um, and it, it developed uh, out of a need to provide a textbook that was written at a more accessible level for students, both in terms of uh, the linguistic content that, that was in it, but also presenting it um, at a, at a level of uh, Spanish language that, that uh, students had mastered at that point. So a, a big problem was that existing textbooks for this topic either required a greater mastery of Spanish language than the students had, or that uh, the linguistic content was presented in a way that uh, was a little bit beyond their depth. Um, so th this uh, textbook, which uh, is still in development, um, has been created over time in a, in a modular fashion, uh, beginning with a, a study guide assignment, which you'll see a small snippet of on the uh, left side of the, the slide. Um, and so we initially collaborated on, on revising this, this study guide assignment, and then um, that became kind of the basis for, for the chapters of the textbook. And then over subsequent semesters, additional assignments were used to fill out the, the content um, in that textbook, such as uh, practice exercises and other types of uh, ancillary components. Um, in addition to the students who were working on the content in, in the class itself, um, there were also some student editors that were hired to, to help with aspects of the project, like editing and uh, creating some additional content. Um, one was uh, even working on recording an audio version of the book to make it more accessible. Um, if, if you'd like to take a look at uh, the book itself, the URL on the uh, right side of the slide has um, a link to that, and I can put that in the chat as well. And also, the, if, if you'd like to learn more about the project itself, there's a chapter from the book, uh, Open Pedagogy uh, Approaches, which uh, I will also link to in the chat. And so you can learn more about that project if you're so inclined. Um, so moving on, um, you know, in terms of lessons that we learned from this project, uh, first of all, one thing that was really important was that this was a, a nonlinear process. Um, like I said, this has been developed in a modular fashion. So as gaps were identified, new assignments were built into the, into the course to fill out that, that missing content, um, which I, I think also brings up another important point, which is that um, with open pedagogy, you don't have to do all of this work at once. Um, you know, it's especially important for anybody who's kind of a bit hesitant to dive headfirst in, in, into doing uh, open pedagogy, you can you know, start out with something small, try maybe do one assignment and see how it goes. Um, you can always add to it later uh, and build upon that work. So you don't have to go into it with the attitude of, I'm going to create this entire textbook from scratch in one semester or something like that. Um, Cause that can certainly be a very heavy lift. Um, in addition to that, uh, the importance of uh, the grading methodology that, that you use. Um, so this is a new way of working for a lot of students um, and they can be a bit hung up on, on, on the grading aspect of it, uh, especially as their, their work is going to be, uh, you know, more widely available than what they're used to where they're just, you know, handing in an assignment and only the, the uh, instructor takes a look at it. Um, so in this course, the, the work was uh, graded on a credit, no credit basis, uh, which is coming from uh, specifications grading. Um, and students had opportunities to revise their work. So that, you know, it was good in terms of uh, sort of dealing with some of the anxiety that students had about grading, but also it helps in terms of uh, not having to do a lot of remediation of the content uh, afterward whenever you're starting to assemble the pieces of the textbook. If they've 
you know, put that extra work into revising it along the way, then there's less that you have to do on the back end. Um, in addition to that, uh, as I already mentioned, the, the importance of student agency. So the students uh, the collectively as a, as a class decided upon the, the license that they would use for their, um, for their textbook. And also I did a, a workshop about uh, Creative Commons with them so that they could make an informed decision about all of that. And um, also that students had the choice of whether or not to include their work in the textbook. So, uh, you know, they, they could opt in or opt out and there was no impact on their grade uh, based on their choice. In fact, they, the instructor wasn't even aware of whether or not they chose to opt in or opt out until after semester uh, grades had been, had been uh, submitted. Um, also, the, the importance of, uh, you know, thinking about any kinds of social justice aspects, goals that you want to build in, into the, uh, the work itself. Um, so Dr. Ganeshan chose to include discussions of some social justice issues in the textbook, things like uh, the benefits and challenges of being uh, multilingual, uh, the connection between accents and prejudice, and, and some other topics um, as, a, as a way of making it more relevant to students, especially students who uh, weren't going to pursue linguistics as a major or as a career. Um, you know, it, make, it makes it more relevant to uh, their their experience. Um, and then finally, uh, the importance of hiring students who who might have uh, specialized skills that uh, would be important for the project. So, as I mentioned, there were these student editors who were hired to do some of these uh, other pieces that the the students in the course itself didn't have that, that specialized knowledge or uh, skills. Um, and in addition to the, the student editors, there was also an art student who was hired to do some illustrations for, for the book as well. Um, so now I'll go ahead and pass it over to Christina to talk about uh, her, her project. Okay, so the long-term open pedagogy project that I'm embedded in um, was piloted this past spring semester in an undergraduate English literature course taught by Dr. Rosa Nicosia, who's a professor of Renaissance literature at Penn State Abington. And it was redesigned, um, actually using a couple of um, initiatives and grants at our campus to do a couple of things. <laughs> One of them was resigned, redesigned to, for an OER grant. So to take advantage of the fact that pre and early mo modern literature is in the public domain, largely. So that was a great thing, right? Um, the OER grant was also used to spur on this open pedagogy project to involve students in the development of the materials. And then there was a, another grant, I can't remember the name of it, um, Innovative Pedagogy maybe at our campus, that the faculty member wanted to really revise the content of the course and very purposely and intentionally include diverse voices and perspectives. Um, and so um, we took a look at, right, um, your typical sort of early modern English literature canon and made a ton of changes. And we were inspired by Robin DeRosa's open anthology of early American literature and the work that she did there with students. So for the project, we ended up using um, OER anthologies that already live out there. We found them on the Open Textbook Network. And we found some open digital scholarly editions as well um, of female authors from the time period. Um, and so we focused on those for the very traditional 10 week seminar style English class. And then we switched over to this final editorial project. You can see the directions on the left side of the uh, slide there, um, where we asked students to either remix, annotate, gloss, that's an and actually, and contextualize one course reading of their choice by researching and authoring an introductory header, four footnotes, and two images for inclusion, if they consent, consent it, ultimately in a future open access textbook on transatlantic pre-modern literature. Because again, we were really trying to get away from the sort of traditional um, Western British canon. Um, and that's a way we thought we could really bring in additional voices. On the right side, you'll see one of the students, actually that's a little hard to read, but they wrote a footnote for um, an extensive footnote for Hester Poulter's poem, An Invitation to the Country. And she did some research um, about one of the lines in the poem and found some images to go along with it, which was a great opportunity for me to teach about creative commons and licensing and the such. So in terms of um, lessons that we learned from this, um, there one, there were some challenges. <laughs> um, asking students to write something, at least in a very traditional American, English classroom um, that wasn't sort of a, um, a textual analysis was actually a little bit of a challenge for students. And they had a lot of questions around the format, 
right? They weren't used to writing extensive footnotes or researching extensive footnotes. They weren't used to writing an introductory header. Um, you know, maybe they had done that back in elementary school when you research a topic, but they weren't used to doing that in college. And so we had a lot of do a lot of scaffolding and signposting, going back to those OER texts, um, especially those ones where those other open pedagogy ones where students had contributed and pointing to that students had written these things, right? That students can do this and then can make really important contributions and also to point out format. Um, so that was one of our big lessons learned. Students, there was a little bit of emotion, maybe more than usual, um, or maybe it was just more apparent than usual. They were both excited about the project. Some were just like, wow, my dream is to have my name in a book someday. So that was exciting. Um, others had some anxiety, again, largely about the format, what they were asked to do. So to address that on the fly, and we're planning it for the next time we run this, um, we added in some additional consultation time and some additional peer review time to meet those needs, address some of that discomfort and anxiety one-on-one -on -one and help students work through what they were struggling with. But many were excited and really curious about the project. And that became clear, a number of things became clear in their final reflection essays and their presentations. Um, as a librarian, so many students talked about their sources. A couple said, oh, the sources, they really matter this time. <laughs> which is funny to hear, but it was, it was great. You know, like they saw that, okay, someone's going to read this, the public or future students will read this. And now my sources do matter. Um, so that text ties in with that last sort of lesson, that authentic audience really resonates with students and created some higher stakes for them. Um, probably causing some anxiety, although they did not have to consent to be part of it, but also those higher stakes helped result in, in better work, better sources as well. Um, and I think the most gratifying thing was the personal connections to the text and the project. You know, we read a wide variety over thousands of years actually of literature um, that students could pick from both British, Anglo-Saxon, um, American, um, some African literature. We did some transatlantic slave narratives and students then were able to choose what they wanted to reflect on. And so that definitely came out in both the projects and what they wrote. Um, one student who has a background is from the Dominican Republic and he chose one of the journals from Christopher Columbus to really explore because he was just like, wow, there's Christopher Columbus statues everywhere in the Dominican Republic. And I really want to interrogate in my header, right? Um, the history there um, and really push back at some of the, the narratives that he'd been used to hearing. So that was another wonderful thing um, that came out of the lessons that learned for us is to really encourage students to make those connections and then explore them in their research. So based on Brian and my collective experience being closely embedded in these open pedagogy projects and our experience with other OER programs, as Brian said, we developed this roadmap to help others who are doing similar work. And it's a module-based project management website. Um, Brian, I think we'll put the link in the chat if he hasn't already. Um, it has a companion workbook and there's actually an accompanying workshop that Brian and I would be happy to do, um, designed to guide instructors in planning, finding support for sharing and sustaining open pedagogy projects that are equitable and inclusive. Um, it's inspired by a roadmap from the University of Pittsburgh, the Socio-Technical Sustainability Roadmap. That was a workshop that I went to, it was just super practical um, and really helpful in thinking through these things and um, documenting these really important parts of this. A few things to note about the roadmap um, before we go through the different parts of it. Um, it's designed to be practical, like I said, reflection and documentation space to help you think through your project. It's instructor facing, but what we, we mean that to be inclusive of anyone who works on or supports um, an open pedagogy project. It's discipline agnostic, it should work with any field that you're in. We're gonna take you through it just very briefly in order, um, but complete it where it works for you. If as you're listening to the different sections of the roadmap, you think, ooh, those are things I haven't thought about it, then maybe if you do this, you start there. Um, and finally, it's adaptable, right? Take what you need, leave the rest, do what works for you. So to begin, um, there's four sections. I'm gonna start out with the, the first one where we, we, we consider the first one, which is thinking about the scope of your project. Um, when we designed this first part, we actually designed it very intentionally. As you can see, A1 there, the little blue column, is having instructors to find their values and their goals um, and then their capacity before scoping out the what of the project, because those are really crucial for determining what you can do, why you're gonna do it, um, and how you're gonna do it. You've gotta know why you're in it right, and what you have the capacity to accomplish before you can figure out what the product is at the end. Um, an essential value to think about, as many of you have talked about today, um, because things aren't inherent, is to consider how your project can center diversity, equity, and inclusion. A hallmark of open education is that it prioritizes access. Um, open pedagogy centers access, but in a way that prioritizes student access to participatory knowledge creation. And when we invite students to bring the whole of themselves to creating or modifying course content, 
that course content will inevitably be changed to reflect the diversity and complexity of student identities, um, which is really important. And so we give you some ideas on the website to think about those values and those goals. Um, and one of the things that we point to is Rajiv Danjiani's five R's for open pedagogy. Um, it's really important to reflect on these things. So to think about how we can consider whose voices are missing, how we can think about our localized student identities and how we can include those voices in a way that's inclusive and equitable. Um, and so this particular this set of values, if you're thinking about, well, I'm not sure why I'm in this or what, what open pedagogy means to me, this may be, these may be some things for you to think through and see what speaks to you. I won't go through all of them. I just wanna point out that um, an interesting value that I always think that he has here is risk. Um, is a really important piece to think about it. And you may not think about it as a value, um, but there is a risk present with open pedagogy, perhaps higher for some than others. And that's why those consent forms, right? And Brian and I give a number of links to some sample consent forms. We give a link to some um, things to think through as you're thinking about working with student collaborators. Um, and when I, we heard um, Rajiv speak at the OER Certificate of Librarianship, and he talked about um, the importance of having entrance and exit ramps for students in open pedagogy, right? That there are ways for them to, um, various means of participating in open, but never requiring it. And I'll say that in the project that I was on, we had some students who did excellent work who at the end we found out after grades were all done that they decided not to be included, right? And that's none of our business. That's why we give them that consent. It was disappointing a little bit, but also that's, I think it's important to go in with knowing that you may have some students that do not choose to participate in the open piece of it, um, and that's okay. Right, um, you have to value and you have to really um, respect their decision there. So once you've thought about those values um, and your goals, then we ask you to think about your capacity. <laughs> um, and it's really important how much time you really have, honestly, is something to consider. Um, it also helps to think about where you could benefit from collaborators and using what's already available. And so when Dr. Nicosi and I were doing this, we realized there were some great resources out there, OER anthologies that we could pull from. Right, we didn't have to start all over. We didn't have to find all these things in the public domain. And that was a big time saver for us. And then finally, once you've scoped out the values and your capacity, then you want to think about the project itself, defining its parameters. What will they be doing? When will it be completed? What content needs to be covered for for curriculum requirements? What's the process going to look like? And where is it going to happen? Um, and I'd say just be open-minded about those things. Right, as Brian mentioned, um, nonlinear is helpful. So the project that I'm working on, we started thinking about it as a five-year project, right? And students will build on this and classes will build on over time. Um, and we also decided based on time constraints for us and for students and just right the semester that we would have students do the work in the learning management system in Canvas and not have them try to figure out how to learn press books or any of those other things, other things. Keep it simple, that piece of it for the scope. So once you've thought about the scope, the next section of the roadmap is all about identifying support. Um, you know, open pedagogy projects are inherently collaborative because you're inviting students into the process. And so it's good to think about what other collaboration you will need in order to make it um, successful and inclusive. Um, and so we break it down into three types. Think about your structural and your systemic support, um, what's available at your institutional level to, to support this kind of work. First of all, you doing this in the classroom so that when you have to articulate what you've done right in a review or something, um, that you can go back to those pieces and, and connect it to the work that your institution does is, is important. Um, next, you wanna think about your logistical support. Those are the people that can help. Librarians like Brian and I, instructional designers, production specialists, accessibility ex experts are all really important people to reach out to at the beginning of your project or before you've even started, right? Here's what I'm planning on doing. What do I need to be aware of? when I do this. Um, so reach out to those folks, it's important. And at some point as Brian did in his project and we intend to do in our project, we may be paying, compensating students, right? To help support the logistics of it, to do the editing perhaps, um, or students that are um, perhaps higher level students who can do some content editing work as well. Right? Um, and then finally, because open pedagogy always involves technology, everything is technology, um, thinking about what technology support your support your project, right? How are they funded? Um, Penn State has just gone through changing multiple enterprise systems that have upended a few things. So really thinking about like, well, how long do we have this um, subscription to some product if I'm planning on using that for my project becomes important. Will students need to be trained on it? Is there a backup site? And I 
I forget to say this always, but thinking about your email as a really important technology in this, because so much documentation for things we work on lives in our email. <laughs> so perhaps thinking about what lives in email that may need to move in a different space for everybody. And now I'm going to turn it over to Brian to talk about the final two sections of the roadmap. All right, so the, the next section of the roadmap is really about uh, refining your content and your process that you identify during that earlier scoping phase in order to focus a bit more closely on students and what the experience is like for them. So, um, you know, open pedagogy is this great opportunity to move beyond just focusing on content mastery and uh, really be able to help the students develop uh, content agnostic knowledge practices and uh, dispositions. So this section first asks you to think about making your learning outcomes less focused on that content piece and more on, on the process. Um, and also thinking about how you're going to assess those learning outcomes. Um, and you know, as far as assessment goes, um, you know, we, we recognize that not everybody is in a situation where they have full autonomy over the, the grading methodology that they might use in their course, you know, particularly folks who are in uh, more precarious or contingent uh, teaching positions, you know, they, they might walk into a situation where they kind of have to run the course as uh, their department dictates rather than being able to kind of uh, change things up a lot. But even if you can't take a, a sort of more radical approach to, to grading, like ungrading or uh, other types of approaches that rely less on that sort of summative uh, letter grade, you can still try to incorporate uh, some practices in, into the course that will foster an, an open environment. Um, so things like uh, peer review, meaning having students uh, offer feedback to one another on, on the work that they're doing. And uh, related to that, having the opportunities for revision, which I alluded to earlier, so that um, students don't feel as hung up on, on the letter grade that you're going to give them because they, they have that opportunity to improve their work. Um, and also having the opportunity to uh, reflect, uh, you know, write a, a written reflection, for instance, on, on the, uh, the work that they're doing and on what that experience is like for them. Um, so in addition to that sort of outcomes and assessment piece, um, as I alluded to earlier, that we also need to think about the agency piece of this work um, and really being mindful of and respecting the agency and the, the labor that, that goes into this work um, from, from students and really from everybody involved in this work. Um, because you know, if, if we fail to do that, then open pedagogy becomes a sort of transactional relationship where you know, students are kind of creating content for you to then publish um, rather than it being a genuine collaboration. And um, as Christina mentioned, we have some resources in the roadmap that really uh, help with that piece of it, you know, thinking about how to structure this in a way that it is a genuine collaboration that respects everybody involved in it. Um, so in th this section of the roadmap, we consider those kinds of ethical concerns and things like how, how are students giving consent and what role do they play in choosing the license for their work? And um, how are you making sure that that they are able to make an informed decision about all of that uh, aspects of the work. And so then uh, the, the final section of the roadmap uh, asks you to think about how you can share your work and what it will need to be sustained. So, you know, sustainability is uh, a, a big part of all of this work. Um, so first of all, in terms of sharing, you, your audiences and the, the methods that you might be using to share, uh, share the work itself and to sort of share your story about the work um, may differ depending on what your motives are. So, you know, are you trying to make other educators aware of this cool new resource that you've created so that they can benefit from it too, you know, maybe adopt it or adapt it? Um, are you trying to raise your profile within your disciplinary community or do you need to uh, justify this work to administrators at, at your institution? Um, are you trying to leverage this as part of your promotion and tenure? Or perhaps if you're on the job market and you want to, you know, leverage this in that way, and, you know, how do you, how do you present this work in a way that makes you an attractive job candidate? Um, so depending on how you answer all of those types of questions, 
that's going to impact how you want to communicate about this work and also the venues where you would want to share it. Um, so, you know, thinking about whether you're sharing it um, in sort of institutional venues like a, a website or a repository or um, repositories that are sort of more disciplinary focused or maybe ones that are just specifically OER focused but are kind of more broad in terms of discipline, um, you know, maybe it's going to be a combination of, of a number of those different uh, venues. Like I said, it depends on what your motives are. Uh, so then finally, the, the sustainability piece, this is really thinking about the long term and anticipating what kinds of problems or, you know, hiccups might uh, occur along the way, especially over the, the longer term. Um, you know, the, the projects that Christina and I have talked about are ones that aren't kind of a you know one and done in one semester. It's multiple semesters over a number of years, and so you really need to be thinking kind of long term with all of that. Um, so, in in this piece of the the roadmap, you, you kind of go back to all of those sections that you've completed prior to this and look for whatever the remaining gaps are. You know, things that you noted along the way, like uh, you know maybe you need. Uh, a certain type of technological support that you that you don't uh, already have, or maybe you're not sure if you have instructional design support or something. And so that's maybe something you need to, to go back and check on. Um, so sort of pulling together all of all of those gaps and uh, then determining what your sort of actionable next steps are going to be. And you know, when we run this as, as like a workshop, um, we like to ask folks to identify specific steps that they're going to take immediately after the workshop, uh, you know, maybe in the next uh, days or weeks and um, in the, the following months as well, because, you know, we, we go to conferences and hear about all of these cool projects and get really excited about it. And then we go back to our day to day work and email and all of the other sorts of day to day things get in the way. And before you know, it, you've lost your momentum, you've lost your excitement about it. So um, Having those actionable next steps can really help to keep up that momentum, keep up the excitement, and keep you on task. And so, uh, you know, with that, uh, we, we'd like to thank you for attending today. And if you have further questions or suggestions for improvements or additions to the roadmap, we're always, you know, happy to hear about those. We, we uh, are constantly, you know, adding new things to the roadmap, new resources. Um, so we, we would love to hear about that. Our emails are on the slide. You can also tweet us, uh, use the, the hashtag OEP roadmap. Uh, so thanks again and take care. So uh, thank you very much for another wonderful uh, project and initiative. It is um, just so nice to, to hear all the initiatives you have presented for this uh, session. And this was another one. And I really um, congratulate you to uh, focus on the open pedagogy because, um, I mean, it is very difficult to work and implement uh, the OER recommendation without changing the pedagogy. And as you stressed very much about um, the processes is um, maybe more sometimes more important than the content as such, because content change and um, but the processes is so important and you have shown with you, your roadmap that um, you really need to have the ecosystem of open pedagogy. Because that brings also to to quality dimension because nothing is as strong as the weakest link and uh, you also show that there are so many stakeholders involved. You can't um, do this alone as a single teacher in your classroom because you really need to have this uh, teamwork and you have shown that uh, so nicely. Um, so thank you so much. I think we are more or less um, running out of time maybe one minute left. <laughs> I think we start, we stop, we will finish at uh, 8.30 in my time, two and a half hours. So um, with that, I will not hold you for longer. Uh, so we will not have any more uh, discussions or questions uh, because although I would love to do it myself, <laughs> I could go on for hours. <laughs> because I think this uh, session has been just wonderful. Um, 
I will just ask are there anyone in the audience who would like to raise a question, a comment, or reflection to Christina and to Brian? Because this is the chance now. Otherwise, we will do it in the platform. I will just go quickly through um, your photos and if anyone has raised their hands, so I don't miss that. Uh, I can't uh, see it. Um, that anyone has raised a hand or I can't see direct any comments either more than again. Uh, thank you for, for an excellent work. Um, this is wonderful, this is excellent, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> I think that has been true for all the five presentations. Um, I will, uh, with that, just uh, finalize to say we have had five wonderful um, uh, initiatives on inclusive and equitable OER um, and how we can implement um, uh, this area from the recommendation into the daily work and uh, where in, in the area we were working on. So the first one was about the becoming an open education influencer, the Nelson Mandela uh, University student advocates experiences of sharing uh, boy. Uh, the second one was about open translanguaging uh, as internal localizations towards inclusive and equitable access of quality OER. The third one was about open education cooperative, a learning and openness, e-learning and openness, sorry. Uh, the fourth one on OER recommendations to support lifelong learning. And this last one about the open pedagogy project roadmap, building capacity to create and sustain inclusive learner centered OER. And all initiatives are very nicely um, uh, representing uh, this area about inclusive and equitable uh, OER. So uh, please um, continue um, your good work and share with others and not at least in the conference platform where we like, we'd like to have um, your slides and your links or um, whatever is related to your presentation, because not uh, maybe everyone have been so lucky as we have been to have been in this uh, session tonight. Uh, so I think it's important to share with the others as well. Um, so, uh, and the, the chat will be saved. Um, the session is recorded. Uh, so we have everything uh, documented <laughs> and um, with that I will uh, thank you all so much, uh, all the speakers, uh, all the participants and not at least uh, you Alan who have done a wonderful job uh, putting all up quickly all the links uh, for the presentations and the related um, 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 topics uh, on, about the presentation. So thank you very much for that and again th thank you very much for creating such a wonderful platform for the conference. Great job. Uh, uh, so by that, I will um, I wish you a very uh, nice um, rest of the conference and really take the opportunity to network, uh, share ideas, uh, talk to, it, to each other and um, be part of the wonderful community. So um, um, thank you all very much and uh, stay safe and uh, take care and uh, be healthy and uh, keep the good work uh, going. Thank you, Emma. Bye.